Let us continue our examination of uh, the very variety of types of state and um, of modern state uh, organization, of ways of organizing the modern state rather, and of ways of organizing the modern democratic political system. And we will continue, as promised, with the United Kingdom. So let's just start with, uh, with, this, uh, with the words. Words matter, they express something. So I just said United Kingdom. What does it mean? Right? So there are clearly two aspects to this uh, expression. United and Kingdom. So it, uh, it suggests that something was united and it suggests a certain form of political organization, right? Which is a kingdom, which is a monarchy, right? But actually this is not the full name, and the complete name. The actual name of the state we are uh, looking at is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So suddenly you have the component elements, right? Uh, one element being Great Britain, the other element being uh, Northern Ireland. Well, what is that? What are these elements? What is Great Britain? What is Northern Ireland? And why is it Northern? Right? Again, words mean things. Well, the United Kingdom is composed of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And Great Britain it stands for England, Wales, and Scotland. England, Wales, and Scotland. This is Great Britain. And this is Northern Ireland. And why is it Northern Ireland? Because there is an Ireland. And this is Northern Ireland. And Ireland, this island here, is its own sovereign state. And that's part of the history of the place. This reality was built across history. So let us look at how this strange entity was, was, was constructed. Where did it come about? How did it come about to become a united kingdom of these varied entities? And by the way, uh, it, uh, the United Kingdom went this close about a few weeks ago from no longer being the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Because Scotland, this entity here, had a referendum, a popular vote, about independent, independence, about seceding from the United Kingdom of, and, uh, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, ending the United Part in that sense. But before we jump there, let's see how we got here. So, we will use the same map of Europe because it shows the gradual development. And we're going to move fast, but just you do have. We talked about all the states. The states are not uh, God given, created, or evolved realities. States are recent constructs. And we explained how this happened. But in this case, we can see in the concrete situation of each of these states. And it, it wasn't as if history was necessarily leading in this direction. The modern state is not the end of history. It's just one form of political organization. It, it's here now. Who knows how long it, it will be around. It's very recent. So, 800, we've seen already the map of Europe in 800. You see all kinds of strange expressions here. What is this? Momha, Mirsen, Maiden, Siax, and what are these, right? Well, you know, uh, then, you know, modern nations, as mentioned, were constructed also fairly recently, defined. And defined on layers and layers of other identities. So, the populations that, that uh, lived in the British Isles, generally speaking, have many origins. They were, uh, some were of uh, Scandinavian origin, some were of Germanic origin, before them Celtic origins, Romans occupied these territories. So all these layers, you know, it coexisted. And it will be later as, as the state starts to form, states create identities. So at this point you see you know, all kinds of uh, tribes and ch chieftainships and whatever it was. We move pretty fast and you see 900, 1000, 
you see in England. And again, what it, what it is doing, it means that you have a source of power that was able to, to project it, um, its power. That's all it meant. It didn't mean that they had nice little borders and passports and so on. So I'm just going to go to the, to the maps and comment on them and uh, let you look at it. Here, um, 1100, 1200, 1300. And again, what does it mean? It means just, you know, power holders who spread their power. Why did I stop at 1200? Because um, there are many important moments, right? In, in, uh, in 600, they have had the conversion of the local populations to to Christianity, that's important for identity. Then in uh, 1066, you have an invasion from Normandy. Actually, for two and three or three centuries, uh, everybody who was anybody in, uh, in this island actually spoke French. And it's an accident, basically, of history that today these people don't speak French, and implicitly that you don't speak French. Because obviously, it will be colonists from these islands a few centuries later, only about three, uh, who will. Uh, colonized North America. So for a while, this French was the, the, the language of the, the elites, of the educated people. It was a stratification a couple of centuries ago. So, you know, accidents. Um, and remember, it's French itself, <coughs> Frankish, French sort of a uh, dialect, was actually itself a consequence of the fact that the two parts of the former Empire of Charlemagne broke apart and because in both sides you had Germanic tribes, so it, here the Roman emphasis, the Roman culture, that's a bigger imprint, that's all there is. But they could very well speak German, and then English would speak German, well, English people from here would speak German, and then you would speak some Germanic. Okay. Um, another important moment, and this is a key moment politically, is 1215, the famous Magna Carta. Magna Carta, which was a document to which the nobles Remember when I described how in the feudal times the state was organized when the nobles were power holders locally, right? There wasn't a unified state. Imposed limits on the, on the most important nobles of the, of the kings, on the king's power. And that was the, this document, Magna Carta. And soon after there is a thing called parliament that is formed. But the parliament at that point was simply a gathering of the most powerful uh, power holders from different smaller territories whom the king called in to get their support and resources and money and, and so on. Uh, so that's important because you see uh, there's the formation of parliament as a gathering of nobles, of course, and limits on the king's power. Then uh, let's just move to the map. 1400. Note how fluid the borders are. The continuous vying for control. Fifteen hundred, and very important, sixteen hundred. Uh, very important. This is fourteen hundred. 1600, yes. It's very important, 1600, because what happened in, in these islands is that a strong, if you read Shakespeare, you realize how troubled the whole time was, right? But um, many groups vying for to occupy the throne, uh, to occupy this position of authority, and so on. But one thing that happens is that you have a constant uh, strong power in London, which obviously tries to expand. And what happens in the 16th century is uh, that it occupies what uh, we call today Wales, right? It occupies, and not only it occupies, there is an act of union with Wales, and that takes place between 1536 uh, and 1543. So London, right, which is the heart of what we call England, right, expands towards Wales and incorporates it through a union. Well, what's the name of the country, the state we're talking about, United Kingdom. And as you see, what I'm trying to point out uh, is that 
historically, this, is a, this was a process of continued centralization of power. Remember, the states can be more centralized or decentralized, right? The unitary states. Well, this is a process of continued centralization of power, which means taking power from the regional sources or locations of power and putting it into the center's hands, right? So taking power from Cardiff, say, in Wales, right, where there was the center of power, and putting it where? In London. The creation of the United Kingdom is the product of taking power away from the periphery, from the regions, and putting it into London. This is how the state grows, by centralizing. This is why the modern state is a centralized state. Okay, another important thing in the 16th century is the break with uh, the Catholic Church, and not Reformation. They still consider themselves Catholic, but the king, who was the author of the break, wanted to, Henry VIII, you know the story, I'm sure, he wanted to get married again, and uh, he wouldn't get the uh, annulment, the dispensation to do that, so he just decided, well, you know what, I'm going to take over the church in my realm. So, the creation of the Anglican Church was the result of the king wanting, it, wanting to get, you know, uh, successors and, and all of that. They basically decided to impose political power on, on, the, on the Catholic Church. And since he couldn't do that unless he, you know, separated the jurisdiction uh, of the Catholic of the Church um, based in Rome from his own jurisdiction, he simply imposed power on. On the church. That's very important from the point of view of identity and for the fact that from now on this being English also means being what? Part of the Catholic Church in England, which is Anglican. That this will be the Anglican Church, right? which will go through other changes. But it's important that this, you know, it's a imposition of political power over religious identity, and with that, uh, the religious and the quote unquote political national identity become intertwined. This is why many will be then going to the United States centuries later, not to the United States, the United to North, North America, because they were per persecuted here. Why were they persecuted here? Because there was only one church, right? the church of the king, the church of the state. And that will make sense a little bit later. Okay, another important moment. Uh, obviously, we're talking what uh, 1600, 1603 is the unions of the union of the crowns of England and of Scotland. There was a king or a kingly throne in Scotland. They become united because they they have the same king. And later on, this union, union quote unquote, will be also be formalized. But at this point, they are united simply in the person of the king and his, his successors. But this is 1600. What happened in this, in the uh, 17th century, the 1600s. Well, Hobbes and Locke, right? Hobbes and Locke. This is where, where we are. And as you know, it was a very troubled century. So that's what happens in the 16th century. It was a century of what, uh, what I say, civil war, uh, conflict, uh, lack of strong central rule. Hence the Hobbes writing Leviathan. Why did it happen? There was a comp well, there were many things, but the, the two major actors here were the parliament and the king, who fought. Two factions, right? Backed by different nobles. The parliament, again, what is the parliament? It's just a gathering of nobles, nobody elected them, right? The power holders in the regions. Um, and who wins? And this is very important from the point of view of how the modern current, just current, uh, state and political system are developed. Well, it is, again, the parliament. The civil war, I mean, they actually fought. Um, but the parliament winning. Well, it should remind you of what? The Magna Carta. In Magna Carta, the nobles put limits on the king, certain limits on the king. After the, uh, the, this troubled century, the civil war and the so-called glorious revolution of the 17th century, by the end of the century, in 1689, the parliament issues the so famous Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights which puts, again, legal limits on the king, establishing a constitutional monarchy in Britain. This is why today it's the United, right? This sort of a spreading of power by taking power away and putting it into London, that's unification, right? United Kingdom, because it's, it's a monarchy. And it is a monarchy because, unlike in France, their neighbors, the, the change was gradual from a monarchical, um, from sort of, a, never was an absolute monarchy, but from a strong monarch like Henry VIII 
to a constitutional monarchy. And what does constitutional monarchy mean? It means that the monarch is not above the constitution, but under the constitution. And that allowed for the monarch, for the system to grow after this troubled bloody century more organically with less conflict. So, 1689, let's move to 1700. And in 1707, you have a formal act of union between, this is 1700, but later you have a formal act of union between England and Scotland, before that they were only united to the person of the ruler, right? As if two countries would have the same president, right? Um, but now they will have a formal unification again. What, it, what will this, how will this happen? The parliament in Edinburgh will be closed. And they will put its powers where? In London. So again, centralization was a process through which the United Kingdom was formed. Eighteen hundred, well, meanwhile also Ireland. <laughs> you see that suddenly Ireland also becomes part of the so this so-called Great Britain. And that's through the Act of Union of 1801, in which the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, not modern, Ireland, right, it's later, is formed. Again, how? The same process. Taking power away from the, the regional parliament, putting it in London. Same 1800, also the uh, 1800, you know, we're in the heart of, an, you know, the, the time of the Industrial Revolution, which started where? Here. So, uh, Britain, this country that the state has this just expanded continuously and centralized power in London becomes also a very powerful economic force. Also what? Look at where it's located. Since they're an island, you can suppose that they have used ships throughout their history. Yes, well, England, uh, actually Great Britain, the United Kingdom, more, more precisely. The United Kingdom was indeed right uh, one of the greatest naval powers uh, in, the, in the world which also allowed it to have many what, colonies, which is the origin later of the United States. So colonies, so very rich at that point, it controlled uh, basically uh, two-fifths of the world was under British uh, colonial rule. Twenty-five, a quarter of the population of the world was under British rule. So that's the 18th century. Obviously, how different is this from what is going on in France with the revolution? Um, and then we go to the, we get to the 20th century. Uh, so let's go to 1900. Nineteen hundred, uh, of course, uh, major events in the 20th century: World War One, of which the uh, uh, UK was a part, of course, which was fought here um, to a large degree. Then the interwar period, World War Two, and World War Two was important. Why? Well, this was a gradual development. You didn't have a French Revolution cutting the heads of all the nobles and so on. You didn't have that in, in, the, in the UK. It was a gradual transformation. And in the 19th and 20th century, you have a change in how it is set up. That parliament becomes too, uh, from being a house hosting what? A chamber hosting uh, the nobles, right? That's from the beginning will change because this, this, those, whole, those um, forces that I mentioned, democratization, the idea of uh, you know, so popular rule and so on, will also affect. But it will be a gradual change. Instead of closing the doors of the nobles' house, nobles' parliament, they will add another chamber. And so it will have two chambers, right? And, uh, a parliament with two, a legislature with two chambers. One still representing the nobles, one representing the commoners. And that will be the democratic chamber. So you see, it's a gradual thing, and when we look at the political system, we see why it is the way it is. So World War II is very important because after World War II, well, in, during World War II, uh, you know that the UK was basically alone against the world to a degree, so that unified and helped to level the, the society, which was a very class-based society for uh, the longest time. So after World War II, you have a, a so-called uh, collectivist consensus. In, in, in the UK, which means that there is a change of uh, culture, in a way, in which class becomes less emphasized. It's still important even now, but it becomes less emphasized. The government plays a bigger role in the society, is the establishment of the modern 
uh, welfare, uh, strong welfare system in the United Kingdom, including the, an all-encompassing national health system, for, of which they are very proud. It's, uh, very, a few years ago, there was a, a poll asking British people, people from the UK, what is the most important component of being British, and they said the national health care system. Again, I'm not making any points. It's just interesting because it's a specific cultural uh, process and results. So we're going to finish here briefly um, and, and move on to talk about the state and the political system today um, in the next uh, uh, video lecture.